know, the restriction is because the Secret Service protectee on the grounds. Um, so that has to be part of the equation. But whether the defendant had to know that or not is what's in question. And these courts, again, about 50-50 split in the district now saying they did actually have to be aware that there was a specific Secret Service protectee on the grounds or coming to the grounds. It's the Lawfare Podcast. I'm Roger Parloff, Senior Editor at Lawfare, and I'm with Kyle Cheney, Senior Legal Affairs Reporter for Politico. If you keep seeing the courts eat away and chip away at, you know, the conduct that happened that day and whether it is or isn't illegal and whether they was properly charged or not, it becomes a much more nuanced and complicated story if, you know, the heart of the criminal case is part of the investigation that's all getting wiped away by the courts, uh, you know, years after the fact. Today we're talking about Kyle's recent article in Politico about the growing number of, quote, legal and political landmines that could blow up accountability for the riot at the Capitol. So, Kyle, Politico's formal headline for your story was, uh, so people can Google it, is there's a growing number of legal threats to DOJ's January 6th cases. So, Give us an overview of your thesis and uh, how you uh, came to write this. Sure. So we've been observing the, you know, now 1,500 plus cases stemming from the riot on January 6th in 2021. And, you know, for the most part, the Justice Department has been hailing this as a massive success. I mean, the massive investigation overall, in fact, the largest in history and so every month we get updates with this is how many people were, have been arrested. This is how many people have been convicted and of what charges. And it's just they're trying to underscore what a huge undertaking this is. And yet over time, especially within the last year or two, we started to see some of the challenges brought by these very defendants to the charges at the heart of these cases. Uh, some of them starting to take root and and it's effectively not always erasing the cases, but they are undermining them. They're they're forcing prosecutors to go back to the drawing board in some cases or drop certain charges. And it's it's made the whole picture of what's going on, especially with some of the things that are still pending, a little less triumphant, I think, than DOJ would like it to be at this stage. Yeah. Yeah. And what are the just outline what are the key ones and mm-hmm. uh, and then we'll go through them uh, one by one. Sure. So there, there's a few, but there's the number one issue that I'm looking at uh, coming out of the D.C. courts, where most where all these cases are being brought, is related to the charge of entering and remaining in the Capitol. That's a trespassing charge, essentially. And it's basically the only charge that's common to virtually every single case. You stepped across the restricted perimeter of the Capitol. You broke that law. And prosecutors aren't charging every single person who did that, because that would be many, many, many thousands. But Anyone who went into the building, certainly, they're, they're trying to round up. This charge considered a staple in every case. It's just you cross that line, you can, you can at least be charged if not convicted of it. And yet the courts, for some reason, three years later decided, actually, you might need to prove more than that someone crossed that line. You might need to also prove that they knew there was a Secret Service protectee in the building or planning to be in the building. That would be Mike Pence. Be Kamala Harris, who was VP elect at the time, uh, and Mike Pence's family. And if you couldn't prove that, or if they didn't prove it in many of the hundreds and hundreds of cases that have already gone through, then the charge is, uh, is now subject to, to challenge. And so it's a little bit bizarre that it's taken this many years to uh, start seeing these challenges take root. But suddenly, again, this common charge to almost every case is being questioned. Yeah. Yeah, but I guess let's continue on with that with that misdemeanor issue because this is really like you say uh there's more than 1400 of these charges uh there out of the 1500 cases really more than 90%. Th- there is a case pending I take it at the DC circuit. Mm-hmm. Can you discuss that? Sure. Yeah, so this is the case the case of a uh, Coy Griffin who is a uh, Trump ally from New Mexico and was one of the first to go to trial. He was the first misdemeanor defendant to go to trial uh, um, in a bench trial before Judge McFadden. He was convicted of a single count of entering and remaining you know, on restricted capital grounds that day. Uh, and he's challenged it. His challenge has been pending now for a couple of years. And the D.C. Circuit is due to rule 
any moment on this issue. But what we've seen while we're waiting for the D.C. Circuit, just within the last few months, is some of the district court judges have started ruling against the Justice Department on this issue. And this is not an ideological thing. We've seen some Trump appointed judges, some, you know, Obama and now Biden appointed judges all adopt the same uh, view that DOJ had a higher burden of proof than they initially thought to convict on this charge. And, you know, the government is saying this doesn't, this doesn't make any sense. You know, if our read is that if you, all you had to do is know the area was restricted. And if you crossed that line, you violated the law. There, there is a part of the law that requires there to, it, you know, the restriction is because the Secret Service protectee on the grounds. Um, so that has to be part of the equation. But whether the defendant had to know that or not is what's in question. And these courts, again, about 50-50 split in the district now saying they did actually have to be aware that there was a specific Secret Service protectee on the grounds or coming to the grounds. Yeah. And because we're lawfare, let me just tell our readers a little uh, if they want to look this statute up, it's 18 U.S.C. 1752, and there's several different versions of it, but it's things like entering and remaining in a restricted building and, or grounds. And then, the, you know, restricted building or grounds is is defined in a in a way that you would expect initially. It's it's an area that's posted off, cordoned off, or otherwise restricted area. And then comes, you know, if it were just that, there wouldn't be federal jurisdiction. You would just have, you know, sort of a state law trespass. So it goes on and says it's cordoned off because, in effect, um, the president or other person protected by the Secret Service is or will be temporarily visiting. So the question is whether that knowingly uh, at the very top, Mm -hmm. knowingly entering and remaining in a restricted building or grounds, carries all the way through and means right. you'd have to know that there's a protected person on the ground. And when you think about it, it gets really crazy because right. you would have to post, you know, exactly what you don't want yeah. people to know, which right. is that. Don't trespass here because the president is coming. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. why are you telling yeah. everyone? <laughs> yeah. The-, the guy you're trying to hang, Mike Pence, right. he's here. He's right. here. So, you know, it's uh, this is one that really scares me. Uh, and and like you said, you know, uh, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think it was Carl Nichols initially, the same guy that first did the 1512C2. But then, it, since then, like you say, it's been uh, he's been persuasive, and mm-hmm. it's not the same lopsided sort of quasi politically aligned. Uh, right here, here it's. Um, yeah, it's it's quite worrisome to me. Judge, the chief judge, Chief Bosberg, um, recently wrote that um, you know because a lot of these cases are now coming to fruition and they're waiting for the D.C. Circuit case ruling to come out, and so some of these judges are a little conf- confused about what to do. So they're postponing certain decisions, saying we got to wait for the circuit to tell us mm. now. Mm. And we thought we had one presumption all along for years that we assumed these cases were solid, and now we're second guessing that. And he said. You know, it's, he said. Right, he said. District courts ruling on this issue any uh, for the time being while we're waiting is like writing a message on the sand on the beach just to have it washed <laughs> away by the ocean. Yeah. And so he said we, we just we're in a sort of the holding pattern. Yeah. Uh, and the oral argument I think was like December mm-hmm. 2023, so yeah. it's almost ten months now, and uh, quite worrisome. And w- w- one other thing I'll mention is that there is a. Uh, criminal version of the, I mean, a felony version of this, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if you go on the restricted into the restricted zone with a dangerous or deadly weapon, deadly or dangerous weapon, it's a felony. And, uh, more than 10% of these cases are felonies and they will be wiped out too for the, you know, if this, if you need to have proven, Uh, that there's a protected person. And I guess I would say the one thing that sort of offsets the significance of a potential ruling against the Justice Department is that a lot of these cases have, you know, because most of them are misdemeanor cases, they've been processed. People have pleaded guilty to these and they've even served their sentences at this point um, to the extent that even if this charge is thrown out, either they waive their rights to appeal it or they've already gone through the system. But I think so part of my reason for writing the story was really to talk about 
how is this investigation going to be viewed in history? And it's kind of hard to gauge that. But one of the one of the things is if, if you keep seeing the courts eat away and chip away at you know the conduct that happened that day and whether it is or isn't illegal and whether they was properly charged or not, it becomes a much more nuanced and complicated story. If you know the heart of the criminal case is hard investigation, that's all getting wiped away by the courts, uh, you know, years after the fact. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there's one before we leave the this misdemeanor thing. I I don't know. Did you? I I happened to listen to the oral argument, and uh, did you? Uh, I did. It's been a while. Yeah. Um, my recollection is it wasn't. It, it was not quite clear where they were going to land. I think they there was some skepticism, but I don't think I don't know if they fully tipped their hand. But you may remember better than me. No, yeah, I I did not find it uh, decisive at all. And um, but what I was going to say was that how strange the arguments get because Coy Griffin's attorney began to argue. Uh, you know, if, if if you need knowledge that a Secret Service protected person is on the premises. You know, he was arguing, well, Coy Griffin got there after, you know, the riot was in full swing. He assumed Everyone that they, the Secret Service would have whisked Pence off the scene by then. And and so and how would he know whether Pence and in fact, nobody knew where Pence was. So how would he know? So if you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he knew that it gets crazy. Right, because I don't think anybody in the crowd could have really known where Pence was. And so if the idea is they, I mean, it'd be plausible for anyone to say, we assumed he was gone. We assumed he, you know, that the session was canceled. Some some people said they assumed the session was over yes. by the time they got to the Capitol. And that's in other contexts. So, I mean, really, I don't know how you sustain any of these charges if that becomes an acceptable argument. Yeah, I agree. And, and the, the biggest impact is on cases that have yet to be brought. I mean, it, we're nearing, look, we're, you know, we're nearing the four year mark is about one more year of cases to bring. But there's still hundreds of people who went into the restricted grounds that I think are have not yet been charged. And so if this becomes not a, a tool that prosecutors can no longer use, that's probably the biggest impact is going forward. Right. So then tell us one of the other. Uh, this wasn't the sole example you were mm -hmm. giving, of course. What, what was another one? So that's that that one I, that one is the biggest one coming out of DC. The other one that I find actually maybe the most fascinating one is this issue of the geofence warrant, and that's one where you know if in, in the January sixth context, you know because thousands of you know, potentially criminal acts happened all in one specific geographic location, the government was able to get a warrant uh, from Google to basically use their location tracking services to see who was in the, the specific restricted area, the Capitol building at a specific time of day. And you track essentially their devices within a reasonable degree of certainty and say those people probably committed crimes because they shouldn't have been there. And the Justice Department has used that warrant to at least corroborate, if not initiate, you know, hundreds of, of cases against January 6th defendants. And the reason I included that on my list of threats is because the Fifth Circuit, in a completely unrelated context, has ruled that geofence warrants are inherently unconstitutional. That doesn't apply here, but this seems like something that's ripe for you know another further appeals and could become a broader issue. Right. When I first started following these cases, that it's one of the more striking things you see in a lot of the complaints is this sort of map that. And it, it, this is not the proof that they did it, but like you said, it's a it's it's a it's a piece of the suspicion that you then check out. But right. it's a map of the Capitol, the uh, you know, the the um, footprint of the Capitol, right. and then it's like a heat map with that sort of shows where the person, based on his phone's geolocation information, went within this footprint with sort of circles which give you an idea of uh, where the margins of error are. It's really a remarkable and, and sort of, you know, scary at the big brother right. level right. type thing, but it's been an incredibly useful tool. It is. And, and I think in the January 6th context, I think it's actually an interesting case because it's almost a, a unique case because on January 6th, you know, height of COVID, businesses were closed. People weren't out on the street. The roads were closed because of the joint session of Congress. 
And the location that was pinged was pretty much aligned with the contours of the capital. So the odds that you're going to see the, the people that have concerns about geofence warrants are worried about sweeping up innocent people, being uh, being people being surveilled who shouldn't be and getting roped into criminal alleged criminal conduct because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. That was almost impossible on January 6th, because other than members of Congress, staff and journalists who had passes to be there, and that's the thing. Prosecutors can look up who was authorized to be there based on their press credentials or their staff credentials and cut cross them off the list. You pretty much have a, a, a faithful, accurate rendition of who was not supposed to be there. Um, so these concerns about being overbroad, you know, sweeping in too many innocent people was at least lessened in this context. Yeah. And you mentioned in the piece a couple other reasons why we shouldn't freak out over this Fifth Circuit ruling. Sure. Um, the biggest one is probably what the Fifth Circuit had actually decided, which was even though geofence warrants are unconstitutional, uh, they actually upheld the the case that, it was that, that they were deciding because they said prosecutors had a good faith reliance on that warrant. It was granted to them by a judge to, to do what they did. So while you know maybe going forward, they can't use the same tactics, at least in this case, they operated the way they were supposed to, given the belief that the warrant had been approved and it was approved. And you can see that happening here. Uh, you know, these, these warrants were, again, judicially approved, even upheld by some judges in D.C. Um, and for all the reasons I described, why these, this, this warrant in particular is less likely to sweep in, in you know, lawful conduct, law, lawful actors. Um, I think you, you'd be hard pressed to have a judge throw, the, throw out the existing cases, Let, may, may, again, may affect future cases. Um, but I guess the issue, the thing is, when this goes up, if this goes up to the Supreme Court, you never know what kind of blanket rule you're going to get. It just is, you know, it's always a risk, but it is hard to see them erasing cases that have already been brought. Yeah, I I, I think I agree with you. And um, you also mentioned that the Fourth Circuit had, had come mm-hmm. out the other way. So this isn't the only time an appellate court has looked right. at it. And, and I think the D.C. cases, the challenges were brought, especially uh, Rudolph Contreras, his, his opinion was very thorough on this and very compelling for the reasons I mostly outlined. And so I think there is conflicting case law on it, which to me suggests it will go up, but but who knows how when that will be. Right. I also happened to see a, a, a Twitter uh, discussion by Oren Kerr. He's a, a professor at uh, the University of California, Berkeley, now a big Fourth Amendment yeah, authority. And uh, he referred to uh, this Fifth Circuit ruling as, quote, bananas. So uh, <laughs> there's that, too. It's not the uh, only time I've heard the Fifth Circuit described that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Then there was uh, another issue that you brought up in your piece, which is uh, pardons. Mm-hmm. Tell us about that. So this, this is, I mean, this is the, the existential th- crisis for DOJ, which is if Donald Trump wins the election, at least according, at least rhetorically, he said, I'm going to go in and, you know, pardon many, if not most of the, the people who were charged for January 6th, you know, accuse them of being political, politically targeted and says there's been a, dis, you know, a, a different standard applied to Trump supporters versus, you know, and most of it is, is unsupported. And if you look at the facts, it's just not reality. But if he does that, you know, he, he would have the unfettered authority to do that as president. And I think that could essentially erase the legacy that DOJ has built for the last few years on this issue. I mean, that, that again, that's sort of the heart of this story is that this is a defining uh, investigation for DOJ. This is, in their view, an attack on democracy, nearly successful, real existential threat to our government, our system of government, the transfer power. And this is their really strong response to it. And it could all be erased or largely erased if Donald Trump wins. Yeah. And I haven't been following closely his rhetoric. Does he draw any distinction between gradations of violence or have you? Uh, with Donald Trump, he always leaves wiggle room. But I think he, he was asked very specifically at uh, when he was at the National Association of Black Journalists event, does that you've promised to pardon these defendants? Does that include the people who attacked police? And he said, yes. <laughs> now, I'm not sure if, if he, he if pressed further on that, he might nuance it somehow, but that's what he said. And, you know, I think 
he he has argued. I mean, he he made that song, the remember the Star Spangled Banner that he did with some of the people. Yes, the January Sixth Choir. Right, and these are some of the most you know notoriously uh, violent actors on January Sixth. So he doesn't seem to be shying away from that. No, no, it includes the fellow who uh, sprayed Brian Sicknick mm-hmm. in the face and and Carolyn Edwards and as well. Exactly, and then. You also mentioned, and we sort of, we, we didn't even mention it here because our readers sort of know, I mean, know about it, I, I mm. think at this point, but it's 1512C mm. itself, 18 USC 1512C2, obstruction of an official proceeding, obviously the Fisher case uh, on June 28th, uh, the Supreme Court greatly narrowed the scope of that felony Remind the the readers generally what that was, and and then do you have a feel of what what's been the impact so far? Sure. So this is, this impact has actually been bigger than I expected. Um, yeah, so I, mean, the, that's, I I agree with you there. You know the the law itself just stems, stems from you know the Enron Enron era uh, investigation was about. Uh, criminalizing the destruction of evidence that might be used in an official proceeding. And you normally you think of, you know, grand jury proceeding or, you know, congressional investigation. Here, the government has argued that, it, that that official proceeding was the joint session of Congress. And, and most courts have agreed that that counts as a proceeding that would be subject to this. But where the Supreme Court came down was you have to, it has to be a, the physical destruction of evidence or impairment or a concealment of something that would be of value to the joint session and just, you know, being in the Capitol and being violent or being, you know, trying to impede Congress doesn't necessarily equate to uh, affecting physical evidence like the electoral college ballots, for example. So DOJ in response to the Supreme court has dropped dozens of these charges. Um, And again, these were sort of the core felony charges because a lot of people who went in weren't violent but certainly did want to prevent Congress from certifying the election. And that was how they drew the line. If someone showed that they really were motivated to try to stop Congress from completing the transfer of power, um, that person might get a 1512 charge as opposed to just the misdemeanor charges. And, and so DOJ has dropped many more than I expected, especially because I think the Supreme Court left some wiggle room to sustain these charges if they can show that these defendants actually did try to prevent the electoral college ballots from being taken, destroyed, prevented Congress from accessing them, whatever. And so what we've seen is DOJ mostly just scrapping the cases and moving along. And in some cases, these people have other felony charges. They might have assaulted somebody. They might have been part of the riot outside, civil disorder. And in that case, it's less of a risk to drop the the obstruction count because you're still going to get them a pretty significant sentence. But in cases where 1512 is the only felony, you're talking about a big disparity in what they might get versus what they can get with just misdemeanor charges. Yeah, I uh, I just checked some of these, uh, happened to check some of these before the interview. Like Anthony Williams got um, 60 months without that. He, he's one of the ones that has where 1512C, that was his only felony. Without it, it, it drops to 12 months. Matt Bledsoe, 48 months. Without it, it drops to 12 months. Yep. Although it's still being litigated whether the judge might, in theory, have the right to resentence and could could make those misdemeanor convictions go consecutive. But right. I know at least one judge does not seem inclined to right. do that. And then... Uh, I think it's even had an impact. You mentioned on on one of the people that did uh, have another felony. Uh, he's had his uh, sentence reduced as a result of this. Well, I know Thomas Robertson. I don't know if that's who you're thinking of. Thomas yeah. Robertson. He he was he actually was one of the key cases that went up to the appeals court on on the 1512 count, and the appeals court ruled that the obstruction count could stand before this is obviously before the Supreme Court decided against that. But he, the government dropped his obstruction count, and he was resentenced. I think it was from 90 months down to 72 months. So still a substantial sentence that he's got, but he will obviously fight that as well. Uh, he's, he's already appealing that revised sentence. Oh, is he? I, I didn't yeah, know that. Uh, I think it was 87 down to 70. 80, yes, 87 down to 70. Down to yeah, 70. yeah, that's right. And 
DOJ argued that the judge just sent resentence him to the same sentence he got the first time. And the judge was uncomfortable with that. He said, you know, we, we, we can't just remove this and then pretend like everything is the same. But I do think other judges are deciding ways to, you know, vary upward from what they might have normally given to account for the conduct that is now no longer punishable or no longer, no longer charged um, because they don't want disparities to exist. And that's mm. part of their remit as judges to limit unwarranted disparities. Right. Well, uh, am I leaving anything out? Is that have we sort of uh, <laughs> covered your key points? I think. Yeah, we- yes, that that certainly covers the points in the story. I'm sure there's many things I left out about all the, <laughs> the different ways this can go right or wrong for DOJ over the next few months. Well, anyway, I, I recommend readers look up uh, the article in Politico and uh, and read it themselves. It's well worth it. And thank you so much. Uh, we're going to leave it there. But uh, thank you so much, Kyle, for coming on. Of course. Always good to be with you, Roger. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare Podcasts by becoming a Lawfare material supporter through our website, lawfaremedia.org slash support. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate us and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for our other podcasts, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath, our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6th. Check out our written work at lawfaremedia.org. The podcast is edited by Jen Pacha, and your audio engineer this episode was Jay Venables of Goat Rodeo. Our theme song is from Alibi Music. As always, thank you for listening.